Amen. Good morning, everyone. It's really great to be back here, and we've had a really special time with you all. Uh, it's surreal that our time is almost up. In fact, we leave in just over a week, and, um, and we have missed you, and we will miss you. And those of you who we did not know, it's been great to make some connections and to meet some of you. Um, it's also special to get to worship together. Thank you, Adam, for leading us. That rendition of the Thai worship was brilliant. I, uh, I feel humiliated by your excellence in language. So <laughs> I'm going with my tail between my legs. So thank you. That was really lovely. And I think it ministers to God's heart. Language belongs to him. The peoples belong to him. And the tribes and the tongues are his. Um, I think I sent through a slideshow. Did that come through? Okay, Luke. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah, no, no hurry. Um, it's wonderful to be able to share a, a message from God's Word, and I trust and pray it will encourage you, encourage all of us. I felt God put this passage on my heart that has been uh, so beautifully read. So we're, we're talking about salvation going to the ends of the earth, uh, as God's salvation purpose going to the ends of the earth. And uh, as we have come back here, we've had some of these things in our hearts, especially to bring that challenge or that call of the ends of the earth. We're not at the absolute ends of the earth relative to Luton, but we're some distance away. <clears throat> and I've been encouraged as I've been back here to see and hear of some of the good things God is doing in Luton. And whether it's in Bushmead or it's in Chiang Mai, Thailand, we see him building his kingdom as people put their faith and trust in him. It's the same God. It's the same work that he intends to do which is part of why we can worship him together, even in different languages. I give thanks when I'm at home, and uh, we can move to the next slide, please. I give thanks when I'm at home because there is a history, a long history, in these islands. I've spent some time in Northern Ireland and also here on this trip. Uh, there's a long history in these islands of mission and missionary endeavor, a long track record of the, the, the purposes and the history of God in this land, and in these islands. The UK in particular has been very profoundly used by God over the centuries to send workers, people who would take the good news about Jesus to places far away. I was just talking yesterday with Nigel about um, history, those first people who brought the gospel, and it seems that it, it's, a, it's an amazing history. Um, I believe he wants to stir up that passion of fresh in our hearts, and that's a, uh, it's a heritage that we carry in this land that even if we don't feel it, even if you don't think much about that necessarily, it is the lineage that we come from. It's not anything better than anyone else in God, but there is a lineage of missionary sending out of this place, and I believe that is precious to God. The next slide, please. For those of you that don't know us, I just want to share very briefly uh, we, we gave a longer thing yesterday, but I'll share briefly what we're involved with in Thailand. We got sent out in 2017 from here, and we had already been missionaries with Youth with a Mission based just next door in Harpenden for many years before that. I think this year is the 24th year I've been with Youth with a Mission as an adult, having grown up in, in the mission field as a young person. And uh, I met Nice, who has gone up to be with the kids. She was banging the djembe a few minutes ago, if you don't know her. I met Nice at the YWAM place when we were in the same team for several years. And after we got married, we, we kept serving there and then moved to Thailand, as I say, in 2017. Uh, the next slide, please. <clears throat> we are involved in various types of ministry, basically extending God's kingdom and strengthening the Thai church. That's the, the crux of it. Uh, but that's through various things, discipleship, uh, teaching ministry, prayer, worship ministry, mentoring Thai believers, and then also the work of the Home of Blessing. And the Home of Blessing is a home for girls, uh, a preventative ministry that takes girls in and gives them an opportunity and prospects in life. And that home was started over 30 years ago by my wife's parents. Uh, Thailand is a nation of similar size to the UK, about 70 million people, uh, just over 70 million, but it's largely an unreached nation. That's the term that, that's used in, in mission work for uh, people where there's not a strong enough local witness in people's own language or in their culture or their context. 
And so about 95% of Thais are Buddhists, and then only about one point something percent are Christians, maybe 1.2, 1.5. Uh, so the vast majority have not heard the good news and certainly have not heard it enough to make any kind of response. And they don't, many of them, even have a local witness in their area. So, next slide, please. Our goal and prayer, and that's just a little clip from our website, is to see hope and transformation and revival come to Thailand and, through, and that through people encountering Jesus. That's really what we're there for. Uh, so, that's all I'll say about our work. Um, if you'd like to know more, you can hop on the website. Um, out the back, I've left some prayer cards, and, and on that, you'll find a link to our website if you don't have one of those already. And if you're interested, we send out every couple of months an update about our work, and there's a sign-up sheet again outside in the foyer if you'd like to get that. I've just mentioned that our goal is to see hope and transformation and revival coming to people in Thailand. I think that's the same heart that we have in this place, it really is communities experiencing the transforming power of God. And that's what the gospel is really about, isn't it? It's good news. There's good news through Jesus Christ. And people can be transformed. I love that testimony that you just shared, Sue. That's a powerful picture. You were literally trying, like Jonah, to run away from God, and he pursued you and brought you back from death. And that's, that's our God, isn't it? He doesn't let us just fall off the edge of the map. Uh, but he actually is like the one who pursues the sheep that's missing. So it's about people here in Bushmead, Luton, England, Thailand, wherever, being transformed through an encounter with Jesus. And this is the most significant assignment that God has given us. If you think in terms of his command, his commission, he has said the greatest command is to love him. That's that vertical paradigm that is the most important. And then he said... Practically loving your neighbor, that's the second greatest command. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And those two are intrinsically linked. But in terms of his commission, the stuff we're meant to be doing, it is that work of making disciples, of bringing people uh, by hook or by crook, lovingly, graciously, creatively bringing people to meet Jesus. And that's not just the work of the vicar or of the vicar and the wardens, of every, or of the vicar and the wardens and those who are eager, it's the work of all of us. It's the work of every single one of us. Even those who are housebound, it's the work of all of us. And as we talk, I think you'll see that every single one of us has a part to play in that. <clears throat> Our text uh, from Isaiah is the one I want to focus on the most. And, and in verses 5 and 6, uh, next slide please, thank you. It says, and now the Lord says, he who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel to himself, for I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has been my strength. He says, it is too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. It's too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles. This is a passage talking about God's heart to restore the people of Israel. We know that. It's all through the Old Testament. But right alongside there, kind of tucked in there in the, in the words of the prophet, is a message that, was an explosive statement, which had they realized in, in Isaiah's day, had they grasped it, it would have blown their minds. They would have seen that the coming Messiah was not just for the Jews, but it was God's purpose that he would be the rescuer of the entire human race. The really good news about Jesus that's captured here is that it's too small a thing in God's eyes that salvation is, is a Jewish experience. There's a small number maybe in this room that have Jewish lineage. The vast majority of us are Gentiles. I'm certainly a Gentile, and I give thanks to God that he reached out for Gentiles like me and not just for Jews. We're not in Jerusalem offering sacrifices, but we through Jesus come boldly, and we've been accepted no matter where we're from or what our background is. Now, I want to put in practical terms for us a challenge that I think comes out of this passage 
It's an extension of what the prophet was saying. It's too small a thing that salvation is just for those of us who are found in church this morning. That's too small of a paradigm, and it does not match with God's heart. It's too small a thing that Jesus is the leader of the Christian club, and the Christian club be that, that in club for its members, and only a limited number are admitted. God's heart, God's purpose is for all peoples for the significant Muslim population in this town, for those of no faith, for those who don't believe there's any God, for those who are Hindu or other religions. The good news is for them as well. So God's heart is inclusive of the Gentiles. It's inclusive of those who hate Him. It's inclusive of those who have never heard about Him. And I believe we're to have our hearts gripped by this persuasion that God dearly loves the world. He dearly loved the world that he sent a Savior, and he wants people to come to a knowledge of him. So if that's true, if we accept that as a kind of a basic assumption of the gospel, how do we participate in that Great Commission priority? What is the part we have to play in that? Well, the first and really obvious part that we make a an aspect of our regular Christian lives is with courage we obey the leading of the Holy Spirit. With courage we obey His leadings, His promptings. So that might mean reaching out to somebody who is hostile or is a newcomer in your street or someone who is, uh, comes to your mind or your heart and you, you decide to give them a call. You maybe never see them anymore, but you decide to call them. Or maybe it's a, a neighbor that you offer to pray with. Instead of just having that chit-chat, maybe in the street, you decide that you'll take that step of faith and pray for them. It's maybe inviting someone to a particular event or visiting someone in need or a word of kindness for someone you see whilst out walking the dog, listening for what God might want you to say to them and not just saying it, the, the basic polite, good morning, good afternoon, but thinking, what might God want me to say? What might God want to share with this person? Undoubtedly, amongst some of the things that he will have us do are very ordinary things, very loving, natural things. But I I believe God wants to stretch us out of that which is in our comfort zone. It's not just actions that we would find easy or that come easily to us, but he wants to stretch us. Uh, for, For our family, going to Thailand was part of that stretching even though that nice is from that nation, uh, that was certainly a big challenge for us, even for her, actually going back to Thailand after 17 years of living out of the country to go back and figure out how to do life with our family, which is not a normal Thai family, and and the faith steps that have been needed within that to leave the the simplicities and the, the comforts of life here and go into a place that's complicated. That has required stepping out of our risk zone. There will be risk zone steps that God has for all of us. I don't know what that will look like in your context. But I believe He will do us, He will lead us to do those things that are stretching and that need us to draw on His strength and power. The scripture talks about the just or the righteous will live by faith. How I understand that is you cannot do the Christian life in any other way than by the faith mode. If you try to do it by any other way, it falls over and stops being following God. And so the the righteous will live by faith means we're, we're breathing in the oxygen of faith, trusting God that He will use us, that He will, by His power, help us to do His stuff. Wherever we are, whatever those steps are that God calls us to take, challenges abound. Challenges abound here. We, we are not more noble for going to Thailand. Each of us is called to obey God in the risk step He calls us to take. And so to disobey God or to ignore His promptings is where we run into real trouble. So I want to pose a question. What might be some of those out-of-your-comfort-zone steps that God has for you this week? Maybe there's one or or two or eight. Um, 
and we need to hear from him, so I, I won't try to propose what those things might be in detail, but we need to be listening for those steps that he would have us take. A second way we participate in that Great Commission imperative is that with faith, we pray for the people and things that are on God's heart, asking that his kingdom would come more and more. And I know that you do that as a church. I get the weekly uh, newsletter update. I see the praying life of the church, the waiting on God group, the prayers that rise up for Aubrey at this time. We're praying with faith for the people and things on God's heart. And this is local things. This is global things. America, even this morning, in a state of chaos and a mess. We are not standing by spectators in a terrible world, just sort of sliding past our screens. But we are with God cooperating to bring His kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. I have found scrolling and doom scrolling on the news, pretty dis discouraging and depressing in the last uh, five, eight years, something like that. And it's been challenging to me, even as I prepared this message, how do I um, bring to bear my prayer life on those things? And maybe go back a little bit on reading that, which is truly taking my heart to a hopeless place. It will include these acts of faith and praying with faith, it will include actively seeking to know more about certain situations or people that God puts in our heart. So we don't pray without understanding. And through prayer, we're joining God's saving purpose. The Bible says in James that the prayers of righteous people are powerful and effective. I love the great leveler that God's Word is. It says that even the prophet Elijah, his prayers were powerful and effective. We are like him. We have, through Christ, that kind of access to God's power and the introduction of his presence into his world. And so God is waiting. I don't think the delay is on God's part. I think he's waiting for people who will take him seriously. I'm challenged every time my mom comes back from Kenya, which is where she's from and where I also was born, and she tells me stories about people staying up and having half-night or even all-night prayer meetings. And I think, goodness, we at times struggle to do an hour, hour and a half. Two hours is really, you know, it's the upper end, the extreme prayer times. I don't say that to, to move into comparison that is unhealthy, but to provoke us. What might be the provocation of the Holy Spirit, not Andrew, but the Holy Spirit, that we be earnest in prayer? As our world becomes more fractious and broken, perhaps the prayer quotient needs to increase. Maybe the prayer life of 25 years ago that was acceptable as a younger Christian or 10 years ago or 5 years ago, maybe God's calling us to a new level, an earnestness, an eagerness, an intensity in prayer, and also combined with fasting. How might God be prompting you and me through prayer to change the environment? The trajectory that Luton is on is not predetermined. It is determined through our prayer and God's people engaging with it. Being back in Northern Ireland for a couple of weeks recently, I was thinking about the Good Friday Agreement and thinking that really came about through prayer. Yeah, Tony Blair had a part to play and Bertie Ahern or whoever it was at the time, but really it was a result of many people praying over many years. Lots of people in England praying for Northern Ireland. Irish praying, Northern Irish praying. I think people around the world were praying for that tiny place. I suspect the prayer level has dropped off since the Good Friday Agreement was signed. And you see there's stuff still rumbling in Northern Ireland. It has to be prayed through to completion. So our part is to change the environment by prayer. The challenge for us in that is we don't get to see the answers all the time. And so sometimes it, it's a there's a persevering there that we get to see some encouragements. We get to see some breakthroughs, but sometimes we're not sure what God did in response to our prayers. A third point in how we participate in God's great commission is with compassion, we join with the efforts of others to bring Christ's light in places where we ourselves cannot go. With compassion, we join. 
So this could be supporting outreach in schools. Think about Julia sharing, being in, in um, Ickneald, right? And, and being a light for Christ in that place. How with compassion do we join that work? That she's not just there doing a job, but she's Christ's light in that place. It might mean getting behind uh, mission efforts like what we're doing. Thank you for doing that as a church. I think you are putting into practice great commission commitment. And so it's not just money. It's not just uh, welcoming us. It's the prayers. It's the faith. It's the embrace of our family. It's opening your hearts to something God is doing thousands of miles away in Chiang Mai, Thailand that would otherwise be utterly irrelevant to this congregation. But you are participating with compassion. This. You're joining an effort God has called our family to, and you're saying, how can we shove this family, lovingly, shove this family forward into what God is doing, that we would somehow together be, you are the shaft of the arrow, we're out there at the end of it, poking the darkness, poking into what God is trying to do. Thank you for being part of that. What are the other ways God would have us participate? There surely are other things that God is prompting. I know certainly, as I've experienced, through your giving, He calls each of us to a radical, sacrificial commitment to help send others. Maybe there's even others in this congregation who need to be sent. And that will take sacrifice. I've been reading in Corinthians where Paul was calling on, on the Corinthian believers to follow the example of, I think, the Macedonian church and give generously to help the Jerusalem believers. And he talks about the giving coming from a place of great sacrifice. What does that sacrifice look like for us to help send? A fourth way we participate in the great commission imperative is that we say yes to going to places that are unreached. Now, that might be Thailand, but it might also be places in this nation. People, families who don't know anything about Jesus. Maybe someone even in your street who is oblivious to the good news. They are literally waiting for your representation of the gospel. In Mark 16, Jesus says, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go into all the world and preach to every creature, the alls and the everies. The all speaks of all places, all nations, all settings, all towns, all villages, hearing. The every is every tribe, every people, every tongue, no one excluded. There's no exceptions there. So we're called as a church to the alls and the everies. I think there are, like I've just said, there will be some in this congregation, maybe others, maybe who will come out to Thailand short term and join in that effort. There may be others who are being called. Perhaps it's not just the home of blessing in Thailand God wants to put on the heart of this church. Maybe there's other places that people are going to be sent out from this church. Wouldn't it be amazing if in the, the great lineage of mission sending that Christ Church would join in that effort and send uh, others from this place? The gospel came through St. Augustine and others over 1,400 years ago, and down the centuries, thousands literally have conveyed the tenets of the gospel such that we ended up hearing it. It didn't just skip down from, you know, St. Paul to us. There were people who were message bearers. They brought it, some of them, at great cost. Some even lost their lives in this nation so that we would know. And so we have a tremendous privilege to be those who have heard. We've heard it. We've responded, and we're blessed to have heard it and have trusted Christ. How about those who are not within easy reach of a church or who are not in a circle where they would hear the things of God? I don't say these things as though you don't care about them. I'm saying them to rally our hearts and stir our hearts and encourage our hearts to how God might want to stretch us to cooperate with Him more. So let me put it as a summarizing question. How can we work and act to courageously obey, faithfully pray, compassionately join to bring this same ancient good news to a broken and hurting world? What is it that God is challenging us to do? 
they're definitely not going to line up and seek to come into the church in big numbers. A few will come seeking, but a majority will stay away. It's, it's imposing, it's intimidating, it's a church, it feels foreign. So we may need to go to the church out and call them, or maybe go out to where they are. Maybe later they'll come to the church, but God would have us go to where they are and be missionaries in our effort that that heritage we share in in this country would continue to new generations. I really hope Jesus is coming back in the next 30, 40 years. I hope he comes back in the next 15 minutes, frankly. But um, <laughs> it seems that many Christians down the centuries have had that same thought and longing, and yet Jesus has tarried. Now, I'm not making a prediction about when he'll return. I'm just saying that I think a short-termist mindset is not what we're called to. I think we need to think the long game. How is the entirety of Luton, the whole of this nation, the whole of Thailand, those 90 whatever percent who don't yet know, how would they be reached? And so we dig deep. We don't just think of, I'll do a little bit here and let me be random about it. We obey God in sacrificial ways for big things that he wants to do over dozens and scores and even centuries of years. Let's pray. Thank you that you are the ultimate missionary God. And when we were dead in our sins and trespasses, Christ Jesus, you came, became one of us, humbled yourself, took off all the, uh, the trappings of your godness, and you came and were one of us. And because of your sinless perfection, you made a pathway anyone who will put their trust in you to make their way back to the Father. And so I pray a, a blessing of Great Commission faith to be upon this church, to cooperate with your purposes for the saving of many lives. It's too small a thing that it should just be the people in this room and the people at LCF this morning and the people at St. Hughes or wherever they might be. We prost, Lord, for a movement of your spirit and a revival all across this town and out from this church to many other places that people would hear who are outside the sound of your, go of your love and the gospel right now. And they would be drawn by your loving kindness and brought into fellowship with you. Thank you for this church. Thank you for the commitment that there has been to sending us to Thailand and to cooperate in that call, I pray that you would expand and stretch that, stretch our hearts more with a greater faith for what you want to do. And, and where we feel overwhelmed by that, Lord, would we lean into you? Would we not be overwhelmed by the need, but would we be overawed by the God who calls us to obey and to follow? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.